What's the crack? Big dogs. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters. I'm joined today. You know, we don't we don't typically bring on guests to to chirp about fantasy football or prospect talk or whatever. But Brett Coleman over there has become a, a dear friend of mine in the industry, and I respect his work heavily. And every offseason, this guy is in my DMs yelling about one or two prospects that he's just just keen on. And these guys, every time I'm like, I don't know, man, I don't know if I'm feeling it or whatever. I go back, I watch the film, I'm like, all right, they're pretty good. And every time they end up being these fucking massive hits that I'm like, yo, I wish I drafted more more of these guys in Rookie and Dynasty or whatever. So I thought it'd be uh, a good episode to bring him on to talk about five players very much under the radar in Dynasty Rookie Drafts. There's a lot of content going out about the Brees Halls and the Traylon Burkses and the Malik Willises and these types of guys around this time. We want to dive a little bit deeper because that's what Brett does. Brett specializes in everything film when it comes to NFL, when it comes to prospects. His YouTube channel is a little bit of an empire in itself. So if you have not subscribed to his stuff, that will be the first link in the description. He's breaking down film stuff that I can't even... I don't even know where to begin uh, when he starts to talk. So, Brett, I usually just hit the thumbs up, and I'm like, okay, this is uh, this is way above my pay grade. Uh, I respect what you do, but I'm not sure what you're talking about, X's and Y's and whatever. Just just tell me what I need to know for fantasy. So that's what we're going to do today. Five players that you are sleeping on in your rookie drafts featuring the one and only Mr. Brett Coleman. <laughs> How we doing? I'm doing great. I got my coffee. I got my cat. You know, it's 9 a.m. out here on the West Coast, so this is the uh, first thing I'm doing. Oh, <laughs> let's my go. Work day. What is it? Was it Thursday? I don't know. I, I lose track of days in the off season, but uh, yeah, no, I'm feeling good. And I'm. It's draft season. My my favorite time of the year. So, are you a morning person? To, I mean, theoretically, like I'm awake in the morning, but I don't like get. I don't feel like I get productive till like 10:30. Okay, so you, <laughs> so you, so seven you, I've been productive at ten thirty. So you're like, I'll just give Nick the zombie version of myself, and then I'll get into the important shit afterwards. Oh no, I, I am, I'm two cups deep for you, bro. I wanted to be on my game because uh, we're, we're talking uh, Christian Watson today, and I, I'm, I'm going to be talking about him way too much for anybody's good over the next three months. Yeah, Watson's a guy that, uh, that's. He, he's one guy on this list that people who are paying attention a little bit to like the rookie buzz and the rookie hype will probably know about. But after that, we we dive a little bit uh, deeper. But Christian Watson's a guy that has kind of taken the the rookie landscape by storm and uh, for good reason. And I think a lot of the reason that people don't actually like know about him is because he played at North Dakota State. So it's a very, you know, unknown uh, school outside of like Trey Lance coming from the area. But Christian Watson is a guy who seems like he's got everything going for him and now that he blew up the senior bowl and i believe you said you went to the shrine bowl and saw him play right yeah well because he uh he was actually invited to the shrine bowl uh for months and he he was going to absolutely demolish everybody there i guarantee it i mean he demolished everybody at the senior bowl too i don't think he lost a single rep um but Jahan dotson pulled out of, of senior bowl and so he got a late ad to mobile and went there and absolutely torched everybody but even taking the all-star game stuff out of it, because we all kind of expected him to do well, uh, just when you look at like actual game film from games that he has played, and keep in mind, they, North Dakota State only played like one game Trey Lance's last year. So he actually had semi-limited film with Lance, uh, and then they had a new quarterback this past year because Lance was in the NFL. But you watch that tape. And uh, my, my comp for him has kind of raised a few eyebrows, but I think it is when people see him, I think they'll understand it, which is like a, a hybrid of T Higgins and Robert Woods, T Higgins in terms of frame, Robert Woods in terms of skill set. Like they give him the ball on jet sweeps. He lines up everywhere. He runs every route you could think of. He's got deep speed. I'm not talking like Jameson Williams deep speed, but still like it's low four, four type stuff. But when you combine that with his frame, his ball skills, everything like that, it, it, he looks like a faster, more fluid version of T. Higgins. And I don't understand why people don't see him as like a first round lock at this point, because those are two very good players. And he's potentially a better prospect than both of them were coming out of college. Um, I think he's like a true 
number one receiver at the next level. Again, looking at the one-on-ones against better corners than he faced in college when he was down in Mobile, he beat everybody. And it wasn't even close. Like, he roasted everybody. It, it was not a competition. So I just I look at the frame, I look at the skill set, I look at the pedigree, I look at the production. I just I don't see a downside here. And Watson if he goes to a place, yeah, for, for Watson. Um, and so if he if he goes to a place that like really needs a number one, like New England, he's gonna get 80 catches as a rookie and probably a, a fairly big chunk of yardage. Dude, Watson's so so interesting. He's so intriguing because you turn on the film and you see this dude who's just absolutely built like I think I think he's 6'4", 210. So he comes in massive, right? A lot of times we see guys that are that size get a lot of steam, but it's almost like they're too big for their bodies. But when you watch this guy play, the way they use him is so interesting because, like you said, they use him on end arounds. I feel like every time I watch him play, he was busting off like a 40-yard touchdown run on an end around. He's extremely versatile. He had uh, a lot of like special team action as well. He was, he was returning kicks for touchdowns, returning punts for touchdowns, things like that. So they've used him all over the place. I think the obvious reason is why he's not looked at as like a first round pick is, I mean, like his raw numbers have not really been there. You look at a guy who's played at like North Dakota state and he hasn't posted a, a, a season with more than 800 receiving yards. And you're like, yo, what the fuck? But that's a team that runs the ball a lot. He dominated the target share. He dominates the market share of everything going on in that passing game. He's explosive down the field, dynamite with the ball in his hands. You look at those like yards per reception number two uh, in 2020, 24.3 yards per reception. That's a quarter of the football field every time he caught a fucking pass. Like, that's insane. Yeah. Um, so he's a guy who's probably going to be a better pro than he was in college just because of the circumstances and, uh, you know, the team that he was on. So Watson's really interesting. I saw you tweet out, I believe, you think he can go as high as top 12 to 15. Is that uh, is that like hyperbole or do you think that's something that really, really might happen because I mean he's gonna go he he's going to the combine I'm assuming right oh yeah for sure okay, um, he's gonna go to the combine below that thing fucking through the roof and then it's you know it's there's no ceiling for where he can go but when you look at the wide receiver landscape in this class in terms of like okay how high can he go like there's there's a lot of you know big name like Dotson is one of them uh Jameson Williams but again he's coming off a significant injury uh Drake London really good but coming off a significant in- injury so who knows what's gonna happen with medical rechecks you can never really put full stock in anything yeah there's no clear uh, there's no clear one i just feel like every team is going to look at this very differently it's like garrett wilson flavor. yeah yeah everybody's got different like there are people that really like trey Burks, burks mm-hmm. you know for what he can be in a couple of years i think when he when he gets a little bit more uh, a little bit more polished as a route runner um he's more of like a height weight speed freak at the moment but that's that's not that dissimilar to you know when metcalf was coming out where, you know, Metcalf ran three routes, but he was really good at it, and Seattle made it work. Like, Burks can can do that. Or even A.J. Brown. I've, I've, I mean, that comp's been thrown mm-hmm. around like crazy, and A.J. Brown wasn't a first-round pick. You know, like, the NFL draft, the way they see wide receivers is is very odd. But, I mean, that's just the way the fucking cookie crumbles, man. Yeah, and so I think once you get all these guys, you know, in a room together in the combine, and you see how they're built, you see how they're doing drills, you see how they test – I think the the name Christian Watson is going to get pushed up significantly and people are just a little bit behind on him because again, North Dakota State, you know, people aren't, aren't watching him on, you know, Saturday primetime against Clemson or Bama or, you know, like, like Burks, you know, so he's, he's one of those guys that I think NFL teams value a lot higher than media, but give it two months and he will get that top 15, 20 consideration. That's going to be crazy. Yeah. I, uh, I've been I've been diving into some like rookie mock drafts in terms of like dynasty. And, you know, when I first started doing the research, it was like Christian Watson was kind of like buzzy in the third round. And I did my own mock draft where I released the first round on Tuesday and this is going to release the following week. So last week it released on Friday. And I think I took Christian Watson at like the 207 maybe. And even that feels like it's going to be low with the amount of buzz coming his way over the next couple of weeks where he's going to he's going to creep into that like area of like the 201 where you're debating guys between like him and you know Chris Olave and I think that's like a realistic comp uh, comp when you're considering everything considering like the upside of where he is the draft capital is going to be uh the draft spot is going to be interesting for him I'm I'm a little bit worried that like man what if like Kyle Shanahan is like yeah I want to reunite him and Trey Lance and he goes to fucking San Fran that would be amazing in theory but then you throw him into like 
Ayuk, Debo, Kittle, and who do, you, who do you play? That's the thing, you know. For fantasy purposes, that's a nightmare. You just take Trey Lance, <laughs> yeah, and call it a fucking day. Honestly, my dream scenario is Kansas City because they need a guy like like you know Tyreek is great, Kelsey's great, Kelsey's getting older. Tyreek again, they he's he can absolutely work on the outside, but I think he's more deadly in the slot. Uh, so they've always needed that other guy in Kansas City, and. There is a remote possibility that that he ends up being available at their pick. And if he goes there, all bets are off. He's going to be a very high pick in Dynasty. What are Miami picks? Do you know off the top of your head what their first round picks are? Uh, they have a couple, don't they? Um, I think one of them's fairly high, if I remember correctly. And then one of them was like 18. Back to that. I, I wouldn't sleep on that because did you see the interview? Uh with their head coach talking about one like Jalen Waddle, but he was he was referencing how he's like, we've had so much success in San Fran by just getting the ball in our playmakers' hands. You know, that's all we want to do. And he was talking about like the Debos and the Kittles and whatever. And I wouldn't be surprised he's coming from San Fran, the whole the whole Trey Lance thing. I would I wouldn't be surprised if he looks really, really deeply into Christian Watson bringing that type of weapon to Tua and starting to build like a Jimmy G type offense for Tua because who knows what like Tua as a downfield threat is going to be in the future. Okay, let's move to second player on this list. We have another wide receiver and they probably could not be more opposite in builds if you fucking tried. <laughs> we move from Christian Watson to Calvin Austin, the wide receiver in Memphis. Now he is, he's someone that's going to immediately get like a stop sign from a lot of fantasy players strictly because of his size. He is a lot of people are going to be like, he's Rondell Moore version two, right? Five, seven, 170, pretty electric with the ball in his hands. He has those like phone beef, uh, phone booth type feet where if he's in a pinch, like he's going to be able to get away from you. Even it's, it's going to be like, people are going to be throwing Twitter screenshots of like, how did this guy and turn this into a touchdown when he's behind the line of scrimmage <laughs> and there's six guys like huddled around him. He's that type of player. Um, so coming from a, a, a school like Memphis, he's a playmaker. Where do you think his upside lies in the NFL? Because we've seen a lot of these undersized players, really athletic, really fun, but no NFL coach seems to be able to use them correctly. You remember that one year where Taylor Gabriel was a thing? I think he's going to be that, but potentially even more explosive and mm. for a longer period of time. Because okay. coaches didn't really figure out how to use Taylor Gabriel till like, what, he was like five years into his career. I think people are immediately going to know how to use Calvin Austin. And I think he is going to be that type of threat. Like, not just the the prototypical slot receiver, but he actually beat press pretty consistently, both in college and at Senior Bowl, because he is so damn quick and his feet are so damn good. And, you know, one of the, the lessons that I think people learned with um, uh, Devonta Smith coming out, which was something I was preaching all draft season last mm -hmm. year, was I don't care if he's 170, because if you can't touch the guy at the line of scrimmage anyway, his weight doesn't matter in terms of fighting through pass, uh, fighting through press. And, you know, uh, Devonta was going up against J.C. Horn. He was going up against the Kentucky corners. He was going up against the LSU corners and nobody could press him. And these are all, you know, future top 50 picks in the NFL, ideal press corner prototypes nobody could touch him calvin austin is the same way showed up to senior bowl everybody sees 170 they try to go up and jam him and they cannot get their hands on him and he just runs right by him i really do think that he can survive on the outside even at that side I, i'm not saying he should do it every snap but if you want to you know kind of do a flip alignment and let's just say he goes to Tennessee and you put Julio in the slot using Calvin Austin outside of Julio is not sacrificing him to the coverage gods. He could actually get open outside. So there's more versatility than people give him credit for beyond the fact that he can also be a returner. He can get carries all that kind of stuff. Like he's, he's going to go higher than people think like potentially round two really in the draft. Yeah. And he's going to go hopefully to a team that doesn't just stick him in the slot and leaves like honestly my dream scenario buffalo because i was gonna say isaiah mckenzie like that could be a player comp for him we saw isaiah mckenzie kind better. of pop off yeah but even better that's the thing and he can do everything that isaiah mckenzie does already mm -hmm. but even more because i think he's he's got a better release package than mckenzie and he's younger than cole beasley obviously so like if he goes there you know as a rookie maybe he won't get uh, a whole lot of usage just because they have a whole lot of dudes but as the years go on, specifically for dynasty purposes, yeah, he 
he would be a very valuable asset. Yeah, he's a supernatural athlete, and you could see it just watching film, the way he catches the ball. I think you could kind of tell how good of an athlete most players are between, like, the first six or eight receptions that you watch, just like if they're naturally plucking it and looking at the next fucking move to make on the field. And he's one of those guys that does that like super seamlessly. And you brought something up too. I'm, I'm not as concerned with the weight as I am like the height. When you combine the two of them, like Devontae is not 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, and that's why I'm like, oh, I don't really care about the weight. But the Austin 5'7", 170 thing does, you know, kind of make me dial back a little bit. But his press, like... When, when you sent me over this list, there was a few guys on here I hadn't watched yet, and Calvin Austin was one of them. So I'll go on YouTube or I'll go over to, like, the Dynasty Nerds film room, and I dialed up, like, three or four games with Calvin Austin. One of them was Mississippi State in particular, and he was playing on the outside the whole game. And the cornerback he was playing against, that maybe it was just because Calvin Austin was so small, but that guy looked massive, and that guy came up to play press coverage on him, and I'm like, yo, this dude's about to take Calvin Austin's lunch money. I don't think there was a single play where Calvin Austin did not just rip him right off the fucking line of scrimmage. And I was like, whoa, this dude's got some serious separation skills right off the line of scrimmage. So you're right. Like he could play outside. He could play inside. I think a lot of teams are probably going to pencil him as a slot guy just because that's what fucking NFL teams do. But he was a returner as well. So he has that versatility, man. So I like Calvin Austin, man. And if he gets that real uh, second round draft capital like you think might happen, uh, people are going to have to open their eyes to him. My third guy, similar kind of vein, you know, we'll stick to the theme of, of wide receivers here. Uh, Kyle Phillips from UCLA. And this was the star of, of Shrine Bowl week. Okay. Uh, I, I would I, imagine I wanna, he I want to cut you off real quick on that because I'm I'm curious, like, if huh? you go to the Shrine Bowl, you go to Senior Bowl, you hear a lot of hype from people about certain players. Like, what is it that you're actually looking for? What What is it that makes you say, like, yo, this guy – came away like such a winner do you just look at like individual reps and he's just you know thrashing these fucking d-backs every time he goes every time he goes up is he just doing drills and consistently looking better than the other players at his position like eat, eat time in and time out because what, what do you look for when you go to those things so it kind of depends because in the one-on-ones those drills are so slanted towards offense anyway right. um that you expect the receiver to win so what i look for in those drills is how are they winning? You know, are they showing the ability to win with multiple types of routes? You know, can they win on a nine? Um, you know, can they win on like against press inside leverage? Can they still win on like a square in? You know, are, are they still able to manipulate leverage and kind of work through contact and, and win? So it's it's less that they win because you expect them to win 75% of the time. It's more so how are they winning? But the real value is in the team period, you know, where there's an actual structure of a defense to work against. And you can't really tell as much live because you're trying to watch multiple people at once. But when you look at the film from those team reps, um, you know, after practice, and then you can see, okay, how are they fitting within the structure of the defense? How are they reading leverage in the middle of their routes? How are they identifying zone coverages and knowing when to sit and when not to sit? And, you know, they're doing limited installs and stuff like that, but it's still NFL concepts and there's still read routes all over the place. Um, you know, how are they, you know, how are they engaged in, in terms of blocking in these team, like full contact team periods, all that kind of stuff in red zone periods? Like how, how are they doing in red zone? And every single thing, it wasn't just the one-on-ones, but the team periods as well, he was dominating. And it actually got to the point where some people were getting a little bit mad because, <laughs> He was he was getting open so early and so often that none of the other receivers that were also getting open were getting any targets because the quarterbacks knew that Kyle Phillips was going to be open. And so, you know, Tanner Connor, who, by the way, deep, deep, deepest cut I will possibly ever give you. Idaho State wide receiver, okay. uh, 6'3", 230, former track star, probably going to run low 4'4", potentially high 4'3". Like. He's the great white hope. He's a fucking massive human being. Was getting open constantly. Is he any good at football? He's good. He's like legitimately really good. But he's going to be like a UDFA because mm -hmm. it's Idaho State, you know. Um, but he was getting open constantly. Or, but, you know, he wasn't getting the ball because Kyle Phillips was getting open in two seconds, you know. And, and the quarterbacks were like, well, I'm just going to throw this whip and get myself a completion for five yards instead of, you know, hanging in the pocket for an extra quarter of a second and getting 50 yards on a go. And it wasn't just Tanner Connor. It was uh, the Oklahoma State kid, the Tulsa kid. Like, all these receivers were getting really pissed because they were smoking these DBs. Mm -hmm. But Phillips was getting all the targets. So he's going to be, in the NFL, I think, the same kind of thing. He's going to be the safety blanket. He's going to be the guy that the quarterback knows is going to be open. 
And my comp for him is like Hunter Renfro on two shots of espresso. Boom. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say like Hunter Renfro, but probably like take out a little bit of the Kadarius Tony that Hunter Renfro has. I don't think Kyle Phillips is as as like elusive as Renfro is, but in terms yeah. of just like crispness on the routes and his like fluidity just within his body and his athleticism he's he just stays separated uh from within like the zero to ten yard mark he's a slot guy for sure uh I think he ran like 92 percent of his snaps from the slot he is yeah. uh he's bigger though like he's bigger than when I watched the film first I was like oh this guy's like kind of jacked you know and I thought he was he might be like Eric Decker type and I was like nah Eric Decker's like a little bit too big to be Kyle Phillips but you look at you look at Phillips and I think he's like 5'11 195 and for a slot yeah. guy that's like you know, we love pumped up slot guys in fantasy because they could win both outside, inside. And when you're getting separation like Kyle Phillips does, um, that's going to be easy, easy yards. He's also another versatile player where he has uh, some return acumen to his game as well. He's got like two, I believe, punt return touchdowns in his career on just like 25 total returns. Very, very, uh, just very, very good within zero to 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. So if he lands in a situation like you're not going to build your offense around him, but if he if he finds himself in a situation like Renfro did last year, where Waller was out and you need a wide receiver one, like Phillips could definitely be that guy. Where do you see him going in the draft? Is he someone who's probably going to uh, end up on like day three? No, I think he's going day two. Okay, I, I think just because you know wide receiver is such a premium position at this point in the league, like everybody wants good wide receivers, and everybody wants five good wide receivers because you need three on the field at any given time and you need uh, two extra good ones in case two get hurt because everybody's going through injuries. And so I look at teams where it's like, you know, they need the third guy like really badly so that they can survive, you know, somebody getting a high ankle sprain and being out for a couple of weeks. Um, the Eagles are, are one that I like, they, I don't think they're ever going to run out of need at wide receiver because they missed on so many dudes. <laughs> yeah. You know, the Eagles would be one, uh, depending on what's happening with Amari and Gallup and Dallas, I would say they're a prime target. Interesting. Um, I would say it depends on how much you like Amir Smith Marset for Minnesota, uh, but they would be somebody I would look at. I liked Amari Rogers coming out of school, but he did not have a good rookie year. So I don't think they're above looking at competition at the slot position for Green Bay. Um, I Green, mean, Bay is, Green Bay has to fucking take somebody like they have no the, I would the, think so they don't have but, anyone under contract but so Amari Rogers and uh, like Randall Cobb is legit the only other wide receiver under contract and I think they said they're probably already parting ways with him so I mean they'll probably get something done with Devonte or tag him or something but outside of that they have to take people from this rookie class you would think so but it's <laughs> so, they, so. <laughs> somehow they're gonna enter the season with one wide receiver on their roster they're, they're gonna see some like five technique yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know, like, Late in the first round, I'd be like, you know, we would love him too. Okay, so well, before we move off the uh, the wide receivers, who do you all situations equal? Who do you like more out of Calvin Austin and Kyle Phillips? Oh man, they're different kind of guys. Um, if you're swinging for the fences, Calvin Austin. If you absolutely cannot afford to miss on a pick, Kyle Phillips. Okay, now we're gonna move over to my favorite guy on this list. This is gonna be the most interesting guy to talk about for sure, and it's this it's this running back. This running back out of South Carolina, Zaquandre White. Now, the way I do, the way I look at rookies and the way I start to break down the classes, I don't really watch college football much throughout the years, right? Like, I might know some of the bigger names and see them uh, a few Saturdays throughout the year when I'm fucking taking down, you know, pitchers and margaritas or whatever, but shit is not in-depth whatsoever when I start looking at the rookie class. So I'll get a list of names that I know I need to be on top of. I won't look at stats. I won't look at like athletic profiles. I won't look at size of the players. The only thing I do is open up like four or five tabs of full game film on a player. So when I did that with Zaquandre White, going in knowing absolutely nothing about him, I'm watching this dude and I'm like, the way this guy runs is so fucking odd. I'm like, he does not run like a running back. He is all over the place. Like he doesn't. The way he like braces for contact is like he throws himself at the contact. He's not like a running back that knows what he's doing. And then I dove into the numbers and the bio of who he is. Turns out he was a linebacker for a little bit. I'm like, oh, okay, that makes a whole lot of fucking sense. Shout out me for picking up just how ridiculous this guy runs. Like if I had to describe his running motion in like in 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 like an emoji, it's that like fucking mad face with the smoke coming out the nose so Quandre white is a really really interesting prospect and then my homie noah who also does dynasty content 
on my channel, very, very analytical and, and has his own like models and stuff for this, loves Zaquandre White. And then you say you love Zaquandre White, and now I'm out here like, okay, I gotta, I gotta take a, a real deep dive into this linebacker, running back, whatever the fucking case may be. So lay out the case for for Mister Zaquandre White, man. I think freak athlete. When it comes to dynasty, if you see a freak athlete running back that's going day three, take him, ask questions later. Yep. Because most of the time it's going to be like a free pick for you, and you know that's that's where we get potential big 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 booms when it comes to dynasty football is like hey take the dude who's clearly more physically gifted than everybody else on the field which white is like he's 6'1 215 you know he's very much like a, a Jarek McKinnon athletic profile and people don't remember that Jarek McKinnon was an absolute freak of nature when he was coming out of school he's going to jump out the gym he's going to run uh, he's going to put up a, a lot on the bench. Like he is an absolute freak of an athlete. And as you mentioned, he's not even super experienced at running back and he's showing up to the senior bowl and beating everybody in, in pass drills, like beating everybody. Like he moves so quick in space. So I think Can we talk about his history real quick. Cause uh, he started sure. his college career at Florida state as a linebacker. So in 2018, mm -hmm. zero carries to his name. I don't see anything on 2019 before transferring over to South Carolina. Was that an injury year or, or is that still like the NCAA made you sit out a year before transferring? I'm trying to remember the exact. I, I think that was 2019. Was that before the portal rules changed? I can't quite remember because I think the portal rules changed around when Justin Smith went from Georgia to Ohio State. I think that was like the first big one, but I can't remember what year that was. Um, but I think there, I think there was some academic eligibility stuff that was also going on with him. If I remember correctly, um, but, you know, don't quote me on that, but I, I think there was an eligibility thing. Okay. Um, yeah. Cause I don't see him on there that matters a lot when it comes to NFL teams don't care, but no, not at all. I was just curious on that. So then he transfers over to South Carolina in 2020 has 16 carries that year before finally so you're look you're you're saying you're going on three years of college with a 16 total carry mark for this kid and then all of a sudden in 2021 he doesn't even really get that big of a workload but 88 carries turns into 583 yards two touchdowns whatever and obviously puts a lot of a lot of exciting things on film enough to the point where he's getting you know people like yourself and Noah and whoever else uh, excited so as you said like extreme extreme athlete and uh if you go check out playerprofiler.com and you pull up his his uh his page like they have his high school workout numbers on there and he ran like a four five one in high school so you'd imagine that he's probably pumped that up to a four four five if not like low four fours for the combine you give a fucking 215 220 pound back a four four you know fucking uh profile and he's, he has to be on your radar and you know probably one of the things that works in his favor he's got literally all the tread left on the tires He's got what uh, ninety something carries for mm -hmm. his entire college career. <laughs> like he's got he he has not gotten worn down at all. So you're getting a fresh, crazy athlete that already demonstrated some ability against really good teams. You know you're taking a chance on him like fifth round probably in terms of the real NFL draft. I don't know where he I don't know where his ADP is for dynasty, but it's probably super low. So, At this you know, point, he's definitely not getting drafted anywhere. I don't. I don't think there's like enough data and enough like real drafts going on right now that he's like making an impact anywhere. But once he blows up the combine, people will start drafting him because they're going to see the numbers and say, "Screw it, I'm going to take a chance." And yeah. anybody listening to this should do the same thing because what do you have to lose? That's it. That's only upside with a guy like that. Like you're, you know, you're using a late rookie pick, a late dynasty pick on a guy with this type of profile. Those are exactly the type of hits you want to um, go off on. What do you? It, what's his involvement in like the passing game? Like he didn't have a lot of play time, but he caught 18 passes, and it's not like a great raw number, but it's pretty good to to see that. And I'm I'm assuming just as like an athlete, when I watch him play, um, you know, his hands look pretty natural. There were some times where he was just like bobbling really random passes, but I I assume it's not going to be a problem at the next level. Uh, honestly, my my main um, in, in terms of seeing how he operates as a receiver, the main thing I was looking at was how he did at Senior Bowl. And again, he was like, there was not a single linebacker there that could even remotely cover him. So I I don't really have a question about him operating as a receiver in, in the league. You know, again, the route tree isn't fully developed, but the mm -hmm. routes that he's got, he's really good at. So I think um, we're, we're talking about a kid that you're going to get for nothing. That as hyperbolic as this sounds. He has Alvin Kamara type upside. He probably won't be Alvin Kamara as a rookie. Noah in his video just talked about the Quandre White and he compared him to a, a drunk Alvin Kamara when he's on the field. Yeah. Al Alvin Kamara that doesn't know what he's doing yet. Like a yes. baby giraffe. <laughs> <Alvin Kamara. laughs> 
<laughs> yes, dude. That's what that's what I saw when I was when I watched him run. I was like, dude, what is he doing? It's like he can't he can't have a, a single run play without stumbling on the field and then like finding his balance and then continuing the run. It's so odd, but like if he gets it together and he becomes a real running back, he's gonna be a fucking problem at the next level. Yeah. All right, let's move over to the fifth and Final player on the list, someone at the tight end position. And this isn't a particularly strong tight end class. Uh, we have the Jalen uh, Weidemeyer at the top. We have Trey McBride at the top, who are, you know, names to be semi-excited about. I don't think either of them are going to creep into the first round, maybe at the end of the first round, probably day two picks for both of them. Um, so we need to be looking a little bit deeper in the class. And I haven't really heard much about this dude, Jeremy Ruckert, out of Ohio State, the tight end there. And, you know, you look at the box score of what he's done in his career and the raw numbers just aren't really there. His final year at Ohio State uh, 2021 played in 11 games, 309 receiving yards, just three touchdowns. But you get that with a lot of tight ends, man. A lot of tight ends in college don't really put up raw statistics. And that's what's going to happen when you're playing at Ohio State and you're competing uh, for targets with like, you know, Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave and Jackson Smith and, and Jigba and like those types of players. Right? Like you're going to be fourth, fifth, sixth in line when they have the great running backs and stuff there. Um, so tell me like what you saw with Jeremy Ruckert that made you think he'd be relevant for uh, for fantasy. You know, I, I picked out Ruckert because I know that he probably won't be the first tight end drafted in fantasy because people are going to look at, you know, the, the Trey McBride rankings. And uh, I mean, there's honestly a million different tight ends to choose from in this class. But when I first really saw him pop up uh, was the year before when he had Justin Fields. And if he came out last year, he legitimately could have been the second tight end drafted. I had a virtually equivalent grade uh, overall between him and Pat Frymouth. It was it was that close. And so I think he would have been a lock for, you know, relatively high day two if he came out last year, but he decided to go back. Why? I have no idea because Fields was leaving. Um, I mean, but... dude, you're like a you're like a senior football player at Ohio State. I, I can think of a few reasons why. You'd go back. I, yeah, <laughs> no, fair point. Fair point. Um, but he's really, really good. He reminds me skill set wise a lot of Mark Andrews. Similar kind of frame too. like, you mm, know, that's like that. 250 ish uh really good hips really good feet body control you know he doesn't have the raw speed of you know obviously Kyle Pitts when he was coming out last year he's not as good of a blocker as Pat Frymouth but in terms of uh you know what people call like the power slot role he could absolutely do that in addition to doing some stuff at Y and H back and all that so I think if he goes to an offense not even that prioritizes tight end but at least acknowledges tight end exists in time, he can be a, a very, very productive player for you. And remember, rookie tight ends almost never produce. That's why he is exclusively a dynasty guy. You're you're waiting for year two and year three. Like even George Kittle, I don't think popped off till his second year. And I love George Kittle when he was coming out of Iowa. So I, it's very much an investment. And you're probably well, honestly, if you're doing a dynasty draft before the draft, a you're insane. But wait to see where he goes in the draft to determine how high you want to draft him in dynasty, because if he goes to the right situation, he'll probably be the first tight end that I target personally. Yeah. I love that. He's, he's definitely like a taxi squad player. Get him in the fourth round of your rookie drafts. Let him send your taxi squad for a few years. And um, Rucker is a dude. I was literally watching film up until like right when we started filming together with this, I was watching Rucker film. And the first thing I noticed was he, he has like legit fast twitch about him, right? And there's a lot of tight ends that come into the league that people are like, oh, he's really athletic. But that's more from like a size speed type of athleticism. Like, oh, he's, you know, uh, six foot five, 250, runs like a four, six, five. But most of these dudes have like the lateral agility of like a fucking tractor trailer, right? Like they cannot make directional turns. But Rucker's a dude who like you watch and you're like, yo, he's actually very smooth. So I really like that Mark Andrews comp because he's someone who can move laterally very quickly. And that's almost more wide receiver than it is tight end and and while he was at Ohio State like a lot of the time I think it was 40 percent of the time he was lining up either out wide or in the slot so a lot of the times tight ends are in line you know 75 percent so he was at a higher clip so he's got experience in terms of like running routes um, I don't know what his 40 time is going to be it might be you know like you said he's not probably going to run as fast as some of the top athletes in this class but I'd imagine his agility drills and the burst drills and things like that are probably going to be uh, pretty slept on. So that's something I'm going to be looking forward to for the combine, which is I think we're going to put this video out on Tuesday. So the combine is coming up in 
two days. Thursday, I believe, the quarterbacks, wide receivers, and tight ends are testing out. So we'll see Ruckert going on Thursday, and then the running backs are Friday. Um, and that will probably wrap up this list of five players. Speaking of the combine, what uh, what are some things that you are most looking forward to? You know, are there certain players that are probably going to do you, do you look at going to the combine and like because you're a film guy, do you say like, ah, oh, you know what, this is probably going to like make or break how I view this running back or, or anything like that? Um, honestly, for the for the running backs, uh, one of the things I, I like looking at are um, the cone drills. So you can see their feet. You can mm-hmm. see how they how low they drop their hips. Like that's honestly one of the, the big things I look at at running backs. Um, I remember when Cam Akers was coming out, one of the reasons, <laughs> like literally the day the combine happened and I saw him do the cone drills. I put Cam Akers as like top three running back in that class because like I don't even care about anything else. So, so you don't even cool. so you you're like I'm I'm most excited about the cone drills, but I don't give a fuck what the number actually comes out to on the cone drill. I'm most excited to physically watch them do the cone drill. Yeah, because uh, well, no, not not, even, not the uh, like the three cone sprint. I'm talking like the the actual position drills with the cones where they're they're weaving from cone to cone. They have to okay. drop their hips. You know, they're kind of shuffling with their feet. All kind of, like the actual position drills with running back. Um, you know, obviously the timing stuff is important, but when you see how well coordinated they are with their feet and dropping their hips in those position drills, some dudes just look different. You know, they call it the Deuce Staley drill. You can look it up on YouTube. It's probably on there somewhere. Watch Cam Akers run the Deuce Staley drill, and he just looks different than everybody else. And that was the day I knew he's going to be one of the three best running backs from this class. And he is. <laughs> I don't think anybody would argue that. Oh, Yet to be seen. Had a uh, a little bit of a sus ending to the uh, to the season, and it should be a, a fun debate all summer with Cam Akers. Um, so I think we'll wrap up the episode there. We've had a lot of. I posted on Twitter. I was like, Brett's coming on the channel. Hit us with some Q and assault. And uh, a lot of the questions revolved around Euphoria. Man, they want to know. You, listen, changing your profile picks a big deal, especially when you got a fucking uh, a whole football field of people following you on there. The the for the people that don't know, who who is your Abby? It's Fesco, man. The world's best drug dealer. Love that. You relate <laughs> to him? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know we have very similar childhoods growing up. <laughs> no, I'm like Fesco. four episodes behind, though. I still got to catch up. Four eps behind, bro. What the fuck? I, dude, I, I started Euphoria very late in my adulthood journey, so I'm, right. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm almost there. I'll probably oh. binge it with my wife this week. But yeah, wrap it up because we need. I think the finale. I don't know if it's eight episodes or ten episodes, but the finale is coming up soon. If it's eight episodes, then it's this. Then it's this Sunday. You know what's crazy? Um, I think I think the show is written by the same guy who did uh, the Last Jedi, isn't it? Maybe I don't really do all that Star Wars shit. It's, I don't know. Some some Hollywood careers are crazy, man. Because then some people do like literally unbelievable work and then they come out with some dud and then they go back to doing unbelievable work. it's very similar to youtube honestly put out a great video and we put out an absolute <laughs> yeah. have you ever like hit publish on a video where you're like man this thing is an absolute piece of shit I gotta do <laughs> uh, yeah I, I have i've never not done that <laughs> it's the only thing i do oh where you get the, like the existential crisis of like <sighs> every I time i hit publish i'm like damn, <laughs> damn that was a piece of shit i just put out there for the people yeah, no. Like that's, when you tell uh, everybody not to draft Mike Gusecki, and I'm gonna hold that for hold that against you forever, bro. He wasn't even he hasn't even been that good. Like you could keep holding that against me, but he wasn't. He didn't fucking move the needle. For, he he doesn't move the needle for you as much as Fezco does, bro. I'll put that's how I, that's how I leave this. <laughs> All right, y'all. Uh, thank you for chopping it up with us today. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you go hit the button that looks like this. Go subscribe to Brett's YouTube channel. It is the first link down below. Brett, thank you for uh, coming on. It's always a pleasure. And I uh, look forward to your euphoria takes continuing on the Twitter world. I'll see you soon, man. Later. Let's get wild.